Good morning, church. It's been a really eventful week, hasn't it? Let's come before our Lord 
and King in prayer. Heavenly Father, with all that's going on in the world, in our country, in our community, in our families around us, and we want to take our focus off of the natural and bring it to you. Help us this morning to, to fix our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, our King, the risen Christ. Amen. about our Savior.
You know, in the week coming up to the election, um, my kids, they came up to me and they asked Brian and myself, which presidential candidate is good, Mom, Dad? And it just made me think about Jesus' words himself. He said, no one is good except God alone. And I find such comfort in that truth because we're just people, we're flawed at best. But we believe and we follow a God who is faithful, a God who is merciful, a God who is good. So I would like as churches to dwell upon that truth on the goodness of God this morning. Let's worship him together. Sing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see The goodness of God Let's sing that again, I love you, Lord Love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me and all my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God All my life all my All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice I love your voice darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God
picture. I love that picture of Jesus who pursues us, who follows us, who comes after us with his goodness and his mercy. We can try to run and hide from it, but it will chase us down and it will find us. you to focus on your Jesus, my Jesus, our Jesus, who chases us, follows us, comes after us with his goodness. Sing it. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I gave you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. morning and we do fix our eyes upon you because we know that when we do that all the other things will melt away in your sovereignty in your mercy and in your love and in your goodness amen Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, let's see. Seems we have some announcements for today. Oh, I'm Peter Lamb, one of the ministers at um, Glendale Church. And uh, ooh, I cannot see that. Let me put on my glasses here. Hold on. Okay, so we have a few announcements today. So uh, prepare for the communion. We, we're having a, a special communion uh, today instead of uh, the other week of uh, the month. Um, so we're having a special, so get your elements ready uh, at the end of the sermon. We're gonna celebrate uh, communion. Um, secondly, in the church breezeway from 11 to 12 noon, uh, I think next Sunday will be the last Sunday we're gonna um, take the uh, uh, shoe boxes for Operation Christmas, Christmas Child. And so drop that off uh, at church um, by next Sunday um, noontime. 
is the last Sunday. And we have a special event for Thanksgiving on uh, November 21st. We have an outdoor parking lot um, uh, celebrations. Uh, I think that's from, what time is that? 11 to 3 or something like that? I, I, I just missed the slide. It's, it's on the uh, website. And also, um, we also have a children's uh, drive-thru. Um, that's on November 22nd, yes, the day after. And uh, so look at the, uh, our website for all the details and you have to sign up for it. So first come, first serve kind of thing, okay? So that's all for the announcements and now for offering. Uh, you can give in two ways. Uh, one way is to mail in the, your check to church and uh, mail to our address, 522 West Broadway, Glendale, California, 91204. Or you can send the, or you can go to the website and give online at the www.fecg.org and go to the uh, gift tab and, um, and you can give online from there. So I'll pause for uh, a minute and uh, I'll end with a, a prayer for the offering and then also a pastoral prayer. Father, I give you thanks again and again because you have lavished your love on us. You have lavished your blessing on us. And uh, Father, you said when much is given, much is required, not only of our finances, but of our gifts and talents and time and all that. Let us give back to you cheerfully to expand your kingdom and for your greater glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And, um, okay, passed over. So, um, there's a couple of prayers for pastoral prayer. Um, let's pray. Father, we come before you, we ask for your mercy. Because the, pen, the pandemic is, the COVID-19 thing, is, it's, it's, it's all around us, and it, the numbers are actually rising again. And uh, not only America, but Europe is even worse. They start shutting down schools, and they're having the second wave again. And we're having another wave. So, Father, may you have mercy on us. Stop the virus. And, Father, help those who are sick. Help, to, help us to mourn with those who have the people, the loved ones uh, of those who have passed away. So, Father, may you give us mercy and compassion. Father, also pray for the disasters that's happening on, on top of the, the, the whole pandemic thing, this earthquake in, in Turkey and buildings have collapsed, people are trapped in there. And, and oh Lord, may you have mercy in there too. May you send the aid, may the church rise up uh, in Turkey. And uh, I also pray for um, the typhoon, Goni, I think it's called, Goni in the Philippines, and it has caused a loss of lives and destruction and devastation and oh lord may you have mercy there father i pray especially for the churches in those places that despite uh, all the devastation that we know in church history it's the christians that 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 risk and, and go out and have compassion even though they themselves have been hit so i pray for that now you give them an extra measure of grace Pray all this in Jesus' name, Amen. Lastly, I want to um, I want to congratulate uh, the president-elect Biden. Now, this is what the news media um, have announced that he has won the election, and church leaders from all over the world have called in the congratulations. I want to congratulate uh, uh, president-elect Biden. Also, he needs our support and our prayers. But also, on, I want to offer. A prayer for um, for those who supported Trump. 
that I wanted to uh, pray for that too. Especially I want to use uh, Psalms 2, verse 10 to 11 to pray for uh, president-elect. Psalms 2, verse 10 and 11 says, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you would give uh, President-elect Biden that fear and that wisdom that Psalms 2 talks about to rule the nation wisely and with fear of you. And I also pray for the brothers and sisters who voted for Trump. May you comfort them also. But most of all, Lord, that I pray for our brothers and sisters that, that, that we put our hope in Jesus, not in kings. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So good morning again. Today is uh, Sunday after the national election. We've all got the news yesterday. Joe Biden won the election. That's what the news says. Um, finally, the election cycle is over. I'm glad it's over, but it seems like the election has been going on for a long time and it's very draining, especially in the last few days. Russell Moore, the Southern Baptist ethicist, said the American political culture we live in is so bad that it feels like every day is election day, but never Easter. It's like watching a football game or, or whatever sports you watch, you know, for an entire year. Now, watching a game for two, three hours is fun, you know. One minute, you go rah, 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 oh, my team's winning. The other minute, you know, oh, they're losing, oh, no. But can you imagine watching the, the, the sport game for continuously for a whole year? The game never ends. It goes on every day, and nobody ever wins. Every day is election day, but never Easter. A perpetual roller coaster of emotions. It is exhausting. So, brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to get off the roller coaster and come rest. Come and rest at the communion table and be refreshed. At the center of the table is Jesus. Jesus used the communion, ta the communion table to unite his followers and to give them rest. But you know, from church history, we know that what was meant to unite sometimes becomes a div the divisive thing. But it doesn't have to be. The choice is yours, whether the communion table will unite or to divide. The spiritual power to unite is there, but we have to cooperate to make ourselves available to it. Now, I want to tell you two stories about communion to, you, to illustrate this. The first story, the year is 1865, June 4th, just after the Civil War has ended. On a Sunday in St. Paul's Church in Richmond, Virginia, and the, the church is still there. I googled it. It's right across the street from the, the state capitol building. You know, um, on that Sunday service, there were many leaders from the defeated Confederacy. You know, the, the southern uh, government that was that lost the Civil War. When the time came for communion, the Lord's Supper, a tall, well-dressed black man walked forward to the communion table. A witness reported in the Richmond Times Dispatch newspaper. This is an 1865 newspaper. Okay, I quote, this was a great surprise and shock. Its effect upon the communicants, you know, the people who are taking communion, was startling. And for several moments, they, they, retained, their, they re retained their seats in solemn silence and did not move, being deeply chagrined at this attempt to inaugurate the new regime to offend and humiliate them during their most devoted church service." End quote. The Reverend Dr. Menig Gerald, that's his name, was evidently embarrassed and subsequently he refused uh, communion to the, to the black person. 
the newspaper continued, and I quote, General Robert E. Lee was present and ignore, ignoring the action and presence of the Negro, arose in his usual dignified and self-possessed manner, walked up the aisle to the chancel rail, the re and rever reverently kneeled be to partake the communion. And not far from the Negro, this lofty conception of duty by General Lee under such provoking and irritating circumstances had a magic effect upon the other communicants who went forward to the communion table. By this action of General Lee, the services were conducted as if the Negro had not been present. It was a grand exhibition of superiority shown by a true Christian and great soldier under the most trying and offensive circumstances." End quote. This is an actual newspaper article in 1865. Now, the first time I read this story, I was hoping that the General Lee would have a big heart and, and overlook the whole race issue, the differences, and, and, and welcome the black man to share the communion table. But it didn't happen, right? To share the ta same table, partake the same bread, and drink from the same cup is a bold declaration of our equality before God. It wasn't a failure of God's power to overcome prejudices, but a failure of General Lee's unwillingness to humble himself and cooperate with God. I want to tell you a second story. The year is 1990s. I, f I don't know what year, but somewhere in the 90s. Somewhere in Asia, there were two house church leaders who could not get along. Now, years of unresolved hurts, misunderstanding, and differences. My father-in-law, Paul Chang, Ruth's dad, was a mission director and oversaw those churches. Now, he tried to make peace between the two leaders. He talked all day, but nothing happened. It's like talking to a married couple who is set on getting divorced. Nothing works. Finally, Reverend Chang asked the two pastors, can we, can, can we come together and let's, let's pray together and ask for God to help us? Both sides said, no, absolutely not. I cannot pray with this guy. He will lead our churches to utter ruin. Now, does that sound familiar to you? You know, during the whole election cycle, Republicans would claim, you know, uh, the other side, if Biden becomes president, the country will become so and so and so, you know, come ruin. Democrats are, if President Trump, you know, gets four more years, America will become so and this and that, and it will become ruined. Remember, desperation and fear will make the people on the other side an enemy. Don't go there. Okay? Don't go there. Let's go back to the story. Now, it was getting late in the day, and it's been a long day, so my my dad, uh, Reverend Chang, says, well, if we cannot pray together, can we have dinner together? Can we break bread together? So after a long pause, both sides said, yes. Everybody's hungry, and the thought of a nice, you know, hot meal, you know, it's just too good to pass on, right? Yes, we can eat together. Of course, before you eat together, you got to say grace. You got to pray, right? Together in the meal. So there you go. They had to pray together. That was the beginning of an end of their contempt to each other. I thought my dad was pretty, pretty clever, you know, you know, to subversively get them to invite God into, you know, into their conflict. So what is communion about, and how does it unite us? Communion is one of the two sacraments that our Lord Jesus commanded. The other one is baptism. Sacrament is a religious term that means a visible sign of something invisible. A visible, tangible conduit of God's grace and power and presence. Now, for 2,000 years, communion has been the most visible practice of our Christian faith. Even before they had the Bible, brothers and sisters were eating together, sharing a meal, and celebrating the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The communion has many names. The Lord's Supper, Agape Feast, the Eucharist, they all mean the same thing. Eating together is a sign of the church unity. 
but it can also be a, a dividing thing, dividing issue. The theology and practices of communion separates the Roman church from the Protestant church. It separates the Lutheran church from the free church and from the reformed church. I remember when I became a Christian in college, I was a brand new Christian and my roommate was a, was a, a, a PhD student and, and, and he was an elder in the Lutheran church. And uh, we were in a Baptist church, happens to be a Baptist church, the only Chinese Baptist church. And uh, he says, no, you cannot take communion. You know, I gotta follow him. He, he's, he's my older brother. He goes, why? Because we're in a Baptist church. So it can be a divisive thing. Even among the first churches in New Testament, it was divisive. But it doesn't have to be. Okay, let's, let's take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 to 22. And so let's take a look, take a look at how the Corinth church, Corinthian church practiced communion. Okay, I'm going to read. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. The Corinthian church was a house church. Remember, this is like the early church, right? There's no official church building yet, not for another 300 years. Well, Corinth is a big, vibrant commercial city in Greece. It has a seaport like Los Angeles. Now, big seaport cities usually is just a mix of culture and people. There were Greeks and Jews, rich and poor. So in Acts 18.4, when, when uh, uh, Paul was in, in Corinth, he said this, every Sabbath he, which is Paul, reason in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Jews, Greeks, rich, poor, slaves, free, all these sides have become Christians. No wonder in the passage we just read, Paul said there were divisions among you. And they were all coming together to do church. And that is the Jesus way of building a church. I'll talk more about that. Now, whose house do you think the church is going to be meeting at? The rich Christian's house or the poor Christian's house? Right? The rich Christians, of course, you know, the rich Christian's house, you know, they got lots of room, you know, they got the nice garden, the big courtyard, you know, they got lots of parking space, you know, for the, you know, the chariots, right? And for Holy Communion, it's not this little waver and, and juice that we, we take. It's a full-blown meal. Meat, starch, wine, you know, everything. The problem in the Corinth church was that the full meal had become a sign of social divisions, and it just runs right through the church. You see, when they have communion, the rich Christians would have a party, a big feast, and they eat and drink, and the poor Christians would have hardly anything to eat. It's like, you know, when we go, it's like when we have a, a, a picnic together, and then, you know, I would have my, you know, steak and lobster, I got my champagne, and I got my dessert, you know, maybe two, three kinds of desserts. Uh, and then, but someone would have a peanut butter, a jelly sandwich, water, and maybe a pack of chewing gum. And then I would not share anything with that, with them. Is that right? Of course it's not right. Now, how much more it is not right when we do this in the middle, when the Corinthian church do this in the, in the middle of a worship service. Okay? Sharing, you know, not sharing their meals together. Worshiping the same God who provided all things for them. Now, if Paul did not rebu rebuke the, the rich Christians in the Corinthian church in this letter, 
the, the rich Christians would not have thought anything, they did anything wrong because that's the way things are. Now, N.T. Wright said this. Many rich people in the ancient world prided themselves on showing hospitality to those less well-off, but they often did so in a way which let the others know that they were inferior and even made them feel ashamed. Sounds like the Robert E. Lee story I read earlier, doesn't it? This is what, you know, this is what they do. They enjoy themselves in the dining room and have pity on the poor and, and put them in the courtyard and give, you know, give them the leftovers. For the rich, the Lord's Supper, the communion, is an occasion to enjoy themselves. It's not about God. In verse 20, Paul said, So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. You see, the rich Christians see themselves more superior. Their identity is tied in with their wealth. They were proud. They feel that they have the right to step on the poor. The poor also have wrong thinking, a distorted self-image. They see themselves as the nobody. One side see themselves as gods, and the other side see themselves as slaves. They're both wrong. In Christ, we are all poor in need of God's grace. In Christ, we are all special and precious because of what Jesus has done for us. At the Lord's table, we need to lay aside this false identity and renew our thinking. We have to see each other as our future self, a future king and queen worshiping God in his kingdom forever. Now, if you want to help our society to be better, the thing we need to do is not so much vote for the right person, to, but to be the right person, to love and respect each other, to be courteous to each other. Now, this was the failure of General, General Lee in the first story I told. He did not see his black brother as equal. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 33 to 34, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Some translation says that you should wait for each other to eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home and so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. This is why Paul is so upset. You know, through their disunity, they were betraying the meaning of the meal. They were mocking the sacrifice of Christ, which had been made them one. Now, Russell Moore, in his book, Onward, Engaging the Culture with, Without Losing the Gospel, he said, the first step to cultural influence is not to contextualize to the present, but to contextualize to the future. And the future is awfully strange, even to us. In other words, we need to be prophetic, yes? Partisan, no. So treat each other with dignity and respect because in the end, we will not be Democrat or Republican, but kings and queens in the kingdom of God. Worshipping not the donkey or the elephant, but the Lamb of God. Amen? Next, it's, uh, next point is about unity. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17, Paul says, It's not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ, and it's not the bread that we break our participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body. For we all share the one loaf. Paul is using the metaphor of the body of Christ in two separate meanings. One was the elements that we take in communion. The bread and the wine. And the second meaning is the church as the body of Christ. Now, he is emphasizing that as we are united in Christ when we take communion, because it, it comes from one loaf of bread. But does that unity mean uniformity? Does it mean that we have to vote the same way? Does it mean we have to have the same conviction on policies? Of course not. You know, in church planting strategy, the fastest, easiest way to grow a church, to plant a church, 
is to bring in people of the same ethnicity, same economic status, same culture, same age group. Why? Because we are more comfortable in groups that we, people that are just like us. Now, Jesus didn't do that. He recruited a team of followers of diverse background. Take, for example, Peter, James, and Andrew, three fishermen, lower working class. Then you have Matthew, a tax collector. They live in the same neighborhood now. So most likely, Matthew have to collect taxes from Peter, James, and Andrew. Actually, extort taxes is more like it. Then you got Simon the Zealot, who used violence against the Romans and traitors like the Jewish tax, tax collectors. He, he's like the, the Black Panthers of, during the civil rights movement in the 60s. Now, did I not mention that Matthew was a tax collector? And they're all apostles of Jesus. This is an example of this harsh, posh dream team that Jesus put together. In the book of Acts, where new church communities were formed, the easy, comfortable way is to have a Jewish church, and then you have a separate Gentile Greek church, you know, separate. But Paul intentionally gathered people from different backgrounds and just mesh them together. It created a lot of problems. Should we keep the Jewish tradition or not? Should we have a circumcision or not? Should we eat this unclean thing or not? This is on and on. Every letter Paul wrote has to deal with these things. But it was the third way, the Jesus way, the kingdom way. Parker Palmer, the famous educator and a brother in Christ, he said, in true community, we will not choose our companions. For our choices are so often limited by self-serving motives. Instead, our companions will be given to us by grace. Often, they will be persons who will upset or, set, or uh, upset our settled view of self and world. In fact, we might define true community as that place where the person you least want to live with lives. Why? Because it makes me rely on God's grace. To give me the love that I don't have for my neighbor. I can't even love my own family as myself. How am I going to love my neighbor? I need God's presence and his power. The communion table gives me that and reminds me of that. God wants unity, not uniformity. Now, say, for example, if your primary social concern issue is about pro-life, but another brother primary concern is about racial injustice, well, let's all sit down and talk about it because all these are also God's concern. Now let's read Paul's remaining teaching on the communion. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, first of all, communion is a sign of a new covenant. Whenever God makes a covenant, he gives a sign. With Noah, it was a rainbow. With Abraham, it was circumcision. With the Israel nation, it was Sabbath. Now with the church, it is bread and wine. A covenant is a promise relationship that God makes with us. A kind, it's kind of like marriage. Now Jesus is making a new promise with his church with us. He says in Matthew 28, 20, he, just before he, he, he ascended to, to heaven, he says, and surely I am with you always to the end of age. With me always, with you always. How is Jesus present to us in the elements of the communion? It's a big point of contention among the different church traditions. 
So I'm not going to talk about that because it's beyond the scope of this, this sermon. Rather, I want to talk about the spiritual power available for us to be united through communion. I used to think that practicing communion, it's about remembering what Jesus did, you know, what his suffering, his death, his resurrection. It's kind of like going to, you know, a World War II memorial, you know, to, to remember the people, the soldiers who have died in the war, you know, for their cause. After all, Jesus did say, in remembrance of me. But the ancient Jewish understanding of remembrance was very different from ours. In the Jewish world, remembrance was not just a mental activity. It was simply, it was not just about nostalgia for the past. It was about asking God to remember his people and complete his saving purpose today. So in the ancient world, remembrance was not merely a mental recollection of the past events. Rather, it meant recollecting the past to give us power for today to overcome. The power of Jesus' death and resurrection coming to us here and now to give us the grace to be united together to continue the work he started, to expand his kingdom. The communion is about the past, the present, and the future. In verse 26, Paul says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now those three words, until he comes, it's about the future. That Jesus is coming back to complete the work that you and I have been doing. It doesn't matter who sits on the throne in Washington, D.C. We have kingdom work right here in our neighborhood. We need to proclaim the good news of Jesus right here and now. We have homeless people walking up and down on Broadway looking for food. I see them. We got young people working in Disney and DreamWorks, you know, right in our own backyard right here. Who doesn't know Jesus? We got people, church folks, who feel isolated and, and feel lonely during this whole pandemic thing. They need help. Doesn't make a difference who has control of Congress for us to do our work here. Brothers and sisters, let's not waste time and energy. We got work to do right here, right now. Now, in the last movement of my sermon, I want to lead us in a time of reflection and repentance. From 1 Corinthians 11, the continuation of the passage, verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord is an, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, when I read this, it sounds very serious, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect to be sinless, to take communion. But it does give us a space to examine ourselves. So Paul's primary concern with the Lord's table, which he makes clear, was unity, not purity. Throughout this letter, Paul uses the, the, the metaphor of the body for the church. So before we come to the Lord's table, we are to discern whether there are divisions among the community, the body of Christ. Is anyone being mistreated? Is anyone being marginalized? Are we coming together as one people united in Christ, or are we still divided? And Paul is asking to examine whether we are, have you, do you have anyone that you have strangled from one another and, and heal that division before coming to the table. He's, he's echoing Jesus' command in Sermon on the Mount. You know, in Matthew 5, 23, he says, he says, leave your gift at the altar first and reconcile with your brother and sister before coming to worship God. In this, you know, election cycle, one of the ugly things was revealed was that, you know, how polarized and, and how nasty Christians, Christians, can be practicing when they practice their politics. 
As a result, you know, there's, there's a Christian movement called the First Principle Project. And go check it out. It's a partnership with three organizations, Christianity Today, which was started by Billy Graham in the 50s, the National Association of Evangelical, the NAE, and American Awakening, three organizations. The, the question they asked is, how can we Christians reground our approach to political life and renew our witnesses to America? The founder, John Kingston, said the church has not consistently or effectively taught Christians how to approach the political world. As a result, our churches in the public square were not known as agents of love or reconciliation, not voices of reason or grace or vision, far from contributing to the health of our political public life, we're often spreading the disease. Now, let's be clear. This is the disease of, one, extreme and toxic polarization, two, demonizing our neighbors, contending for our conviction, yes, but not cutting down, demonizing others in our exchanges with others. And number three, elevating certain political principles into almost idols we worship. So, you know, before we take communion, let you and I spend a few minutes of silence and open ourselves to the Holy Spirit to search you and I, examine our conscience. And, and in addition to the three items, um, I wanted to add three more. Divisions within our community. Is anyone being mistreated or marginalized? Are you coming together as one people united in Christ or, or are, we, are we still divided? Do you have anyone that you feel is as estranged from someone and, and you need to heal that relationship? Let the Holy Spirit search you, search me, and bring to mind anything. And let us repent of that. I'm going to set my timer for three minutes. So we're going to spend three minutes of silence and uh, reflect on that. Then I'll close in prayer.
Father, we come before you. I ask for the grace of the resurrected power of Jesus to overcome divisions within ourselves, within our church, within our country. Help us to be humble and to seek first the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's, uh, if you got your elements, let's, uh, let's take this together. I'm not going to read the scripture because I've been reading the scripture throughout the sermon. So um, let's uh, take the elements and uh, allow the power of Jesus to unite us in remembrance of him. The body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Let's take it together. Next, I wanted to um, um, have a, a, a suggestion for practice. Okay, I'll, if you if you're willing to, and you feel you're ready, take someone out who voted different than you out for a meal. Okay, and since you're inviting that person, you're hosting. Just be a good listener. Invite him and just listen. Don't try to persuade him or inject your truth or, or your facts, and, but just seek to understand. Ask questions to understand, not to point out you know, any inconsistency he or she has, and, and just be a good listener. Share a meal together. And of course, pray before you eat. Try that practice before Thanksgiving, or even during Thanksgiving. Okay. And tell me how it goes. Let me know. Okay. And um, now for the benediction. I use 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 16 to 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.